You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 11. Well, welcome back. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Uh, the uh, the Little Green Cheese blog, which this is accompanied with, uh, passed its 100th post the other day, and it had over 200,000 page views, which I'm very proud of. Who would have imagined a few years ago that a cheese-making blog um, slash podcast uh, would have got up to 100 posts, and 11 of those now being the podcast themselves. And the podcasts are quite popular, which uh, might surprise some people. Uh, Some of the episodes have reached over 3,000 listeners, uh, and the lowest one, I think, is around about 1,500. So, But I think all my lovely guests are fantastic and most welcomed um, to come on to the show, Uh, certainly by me, that's for sure. So anyway, on with the show. Uh, We have a guest today. Uh, The guest is uh, Sue Roberts, and she's from Tasmania. So let's spin the interview. Well, today's guest is Sue Roberts, and she's from Flowerdale in Tasmania. Hello, Sue. Hello there, Gavin. Nice to hear from you, and thanks very much for volunteering to be on the show. No problem at all. Okay, let's start with um, why did you start making cheese? Um, Well, I... Back in the early 1980s, I was sort of really into self-sufficiency and um, I went to an alternative technology centre in Wales, a place called Machantleth, and bought my first cheese-making book there. Had a go at, because I live on a dairy farm, and I had a go at making some cheddar-style cheese, Yeah. uh, which ended up with some nasty-looking green mould growing through it. So totally disillusioned I was. I just gave up on the cheese-making and then if we fast forward about 30 years to 2010, um, I started watching Will Studd's Cheese Slices on ABC television. And the particular episode, which was sort of a pivotal moment for me, was one um, about cheese making in the, the high Alps of the Pyrenees. And there was a little old lady there making cheese in a shed with no high-tech gear, using a hand to cut the curd, and I thought, I can do that. (laughs) And so um, nowadays, of course, you can buy all your uh, rennet and cultures online, so I thought I'd have a go, and that's the beginning of my real cheese-making career. Oh, fantastic. So there was no real urge other than, you know, watching the TV show? And and by the way, it is a very good um, series by Will Studd too, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's, it's great. It's been giving me lots of ideas and enthusiasm to carry on making cheese. So so what type of cheeses have you made? Um, well, I, was, I counted them up the other day after you contacted me about this interview and I've actually made 20 different sorts. Oh, fantastic. Uh, my, my very first one would have been feta and I've made um, things like parmesan and um, Wensleydale from your recipe. Thank oh, you very much for that. No problems at uh, all. <laughs> I have got some camembert brewing in the cheese fridge at the moment. Um, and then various other sorts like um, an Emmental, a Monterey Jack, um, Manchego, Carefilly, um, Parmesan. I've made that two or three times. Um, one of my favourites is a Pyrenees cheese that I, the recipe I got out of the Tim Smith book, which is called, is it called Artisan Cheeses? Something yeah, like Artisan Cheeses, uh, yeah. you can make at uh, home or pe- something. Well, he suggests putting um, peppercorns in that. I actually use the Tasmanian mountain pepper in it, which makes a really, really lovely cheese. I bet it does. Now, I've actually made the same recipe and used, um, I think it's red peppercorns, you know, the um, uh, not like the green ones you get in the tin, which are, are soft, but the red ones are a little bit hard. They're not, they're not rock hard like the black ones. And the flavour yeah. that went through the cheese was fantastic. Did you find the yeah. same sort of thing? Yeah, well, the mountain pepper in the Tasmanians, and it's a, um, it's only found in Tasmania, I think, and it's got quite a distinctive flavour. But, it, yes, it did go right through the cheese and it just made it really lovely. Oh, fantastic. So where do you make all this cheese? Uh, just in my kitchen. Um, I live on a dairy farm, so I have 
free access to thousands of litres of milk, not that I use that much in one go. Yeah, and um, yeah. I just have some stainless steel stock pots that I make it in. Yeah. And um, I go from there. I have I, I, My husband made me a little cheese press, a very simple wooden thing that we sit um, weightlifting weights on as the to, to press the cheese. Yeah. And I have a... After a few months of making the cheese, I decided to invest in a little wine fridge, and that's my cave. Oh, fantastic. So how do you keep it humid? Um, if I need any extra humid, it, it's there's a sort of this. It seems to be a little bit humid anyway, but sometimes I put something like a wet paper towel in there. So with the camembert, I, I keep a wet paper towel in a container. Oh, okay, yeah. But uh, it seems to work all right. Yeah, too right. Sounds good. Um, do you have a blog that you um, you post any of your cheese conquests on? <laughs> yes, I've been. When I started making cheese, I also started a blog called the Preserving Patch. Yeah, it's not just cheese making, but it's all the other things that I do because I grow all of my own vegetables, pretty much all of our own fruit, and do lots of preserving, bottling, jam, pickles, chutneys. Anything anything new I like to have a go at, so there's all sorts of things on it. Oh, it's aptly named, that's for sure. And what I'll do is put the web address into the show notes so everybody can go and have a look at your lovely blog. That would be uh, I was, great. I was reading through it the other day and there's some fabulous things in there. Yeah, I really enjoy writing it, but um, I sort of feel like I'm running out of new things to put on there these days because I've been doing it for the last three years now so it's sort of getting less frequent that I actually put up a new post yeah yeah I, I find look I've been writing my blog for gee nearly six years or five and a half maybe and uh yeah some days it's a bit like that but uh you know there's certainly lots of interesting things you got to remember that the readership you have now is usually not the same readership you had at the very beginning so you can talk about the same things and nobody yeah. minds, I don't think. <laughs> I don't feel, I'll remember that. I've, I've, I've forgotten what I wrote five years ago, so it's kind of like a big cycle anyway. <laughs> so what are some of the challenges you have um, when making cheese at home? Um, well, I think the most difficult cheese that I've tried to make is a blue and I've followed it, tried it a couple of times and I don't know what I do wrong, but... It just doesn't develop blue. Well, the, I might start up with start off with some blue mold occurring after you pierce the cheese. Yeah. But then it just disappears. Both times I've made it, it just disappears, and then I get sort of this slimy, kind of horrible, gooey stuff on the outside of the cheese. And um, anyway, the last time I made it, I decided that maybe I didn't like blue cheese all that much after all. And, you know, I might just stick to the ones that I like. No, I can make successfully. Yeah, for sure. I found, um, and, and I had that the first time I made a blue cheese, and what I did to combat that and actually get the whole, the blue cheese, sorry, the the Penicillium Roque 40 into the cheese itself is when that gunk forms, I just scrape that off with a, um, a flat knife and, and then, so both ends, uh, and then the actual side the round side of the cheese, I wrap that in aluminium foil, so it looks a bit like a um, a log with um, foil, and the two ends are open. Um, so then I continue to scrape any gunk that forms on the end, and if I need to re-pierce, um, then I, I do that at that first scraping of the gunk. And I found that um, all of my blue cheeses that I've made, bar one, um, which I, um, I put the disaster up on the website, and... Um, yeah, they've all worked out fantastically and they've tasted nice. So it's that initial scraping that keeps the air holes clear, I think, uh, because, uh, because the mould needs oxygen to, um, to form. Yeah. So yeah. maybe try that if you, if you really want to make another blue cheese. <laughs> well, I'll see. Maybe I'll get enthused about it again because I've still got the culture sitting in the fridge. It seems silly to waste. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. So what are some of your fabulous successes? Um, I think one of my best cheeses has been that Pyrenees peppercorn that I've talked about. Yeah. Um, I love making halloumi because I really love halloumi in the summertime on the barbecue. Um, and I think I really like making camembert. Yeah. I don't particularly yeah. like eating it, particularly when it gets really that really strong, really smelly flavour. Oh, the, but I uh, love 
I love watching the mould grow. Yeah, so do I. It's it's if it goes over ripe and that um, I think it's ammonia, the ammonia yeah. um, smell because the uh, the penicillin. Um, What's it called? Camberti. Yeah. Um, it, it, it converts um, some of the lactose into um, ammonia. And that's what that stink is. If uh, yeah. the temperature is too high or if um, if it ages too long. So, yeah. yeah, I found that on the second batch that I made of camembert. Yeah. I quite more. like it when it's young, but then we I, I can't eat. Like I'd make five little rounds when I do a batch of camembert and yeah. we just can't eat that much. So... My sister-in-law, who lives just down the road, loves it when it gets to that really fruity flavour. So I can always offload it onto her. Fruity is a lovely description too, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Stinky, I think, not. sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> so um, out of all – so they're the favourite ones, You, some of your successes. So what – as far as the process goes, and you mentioned camembert, are there any others where you – really enjoy the process to make that cheese because they're all different right yeah um uh i i guess i like the ones where you add those flavors in like i've made that wensleydale recipe of yours a few times now with the sage leaves and um with ordinary peppercorns just black peppercorns which i found a little bit overpowering but maybe i put too many in yeah um and then recently i made one with dried cranberries and how did that taste it's it's, it's not mature enough yet but it's it's getting there so yeah. i think that would be really nice i actually tasted a version of wednesday though with cran- dried cranberries when i was in canada earlier this year oh okay so I know what it should taste like and, it's, and it was really delicious so i'm hoping that will turn out it's always good to have that baseline because I remember the first time I made Wensley Dale, it was on a whim, and it was in a a, a, a paper. Uh, I, I found the recipe from the cheese making course that these two old ladies um, that taught me how to make cheese that they they were giving it away in their course, right? And I had Wensley Dale, and I'd never seen the recipe anywhere before. So I thought, well, let's share this. So uh, thankfully they actually retired, so their business went <laughs> broke. So I don't think they minded me um, sharing their Wensleydale recipe. And I've actually heard from people from um, – somebody contacted me from the UK and said that he visited the Wensleydale factory and he said, my recipe is a scaled-down, nearly perfect uh, replica of how they make it uh, in the Wensleydale factory in the UK. So I was quite impressed with that. Wow. Because yeah, so. I, think, I think your recipe is the only one I've ever found. I don't think there's a Wensleydale in any of the books that I've got here. No, I've got more cheese books you can poke a stick at, probably the same as you, that um, yeah. you know, it's not there. There's no Wensleydale recipe. There's like double Gloucester and Lancashire and all that sort of stuff, but no Wensleydale to be seen. Maybe it's super secret and I've cracked the code. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your favourite cheese to eat and what do you eat it with? Um, well, I think two. So the halloumi for summertime when we have barbecues and eating it with just sort of steak and salads. Like in a salad, it's really good. Mm, Lovely. And then um, I really like a mature cheese like a crumbly cheddar. But if you let the Wensleydale, I, I matured a Wensleydale for probably... 12 to 18 months, and it was just fantastic. Was it crumbly? Um, not, not like your commercial super mature cheeses. Um, not quite, you know, the, like the, the Mersey Valley one, which actually originated here in nearby in Burnie, yeah. is very crumbly cheese. Not quite to that level of crumbliness. Oh, okay. But it had that really intense flavour. Fantastic. Like a, like a mature cheddar. Yeah. And and really does, the, the Wensleydale process is, um, it, it is quite intensive because there's that two-hour spell where you have to break open the um, the curds and and, um, and mill them and then bundle it back up again. So, yeah, yeah it takes a while, doesn't it? That's one of it my... It does. Yeah. But I, I, like I, that's doable, whereas some of the cheeses, I have made a Gouda, with the like there are some cheeses that involve a lot of steps and a lot of hanging around over the pot whereas i don't mind that wednesday you you go away you come back you go away you come back those sort of steps i can do stuff in between i'm not keen on the ones where you have to do a lot and be there all 
all the time to be doing stirring or you know getting it up to a certain temperature and then holding it for another half hour at that temperature and stir 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 yeah i'd rather be rushing outside doing something in the garden with a timer stuck on my pocket and then rushing back inside to do the <laughs> next step yeah i find some of the cheese some of the wash curd cheeses are, are like that and and yeah. gouda is a as a perfect example of a of a wash curd cheese so yeah. well done um yeah it uh Sometimes you just want to make 30-minute mozzarella and get it out the way and go and eat it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I nice have enough. tried a couple of times making two cheeses at the same time. Yeah. Um, uh, that can be very confusing because you, after a while you sort of start thinking, oh, gee, which pot's got the camembert in it and which pot's got the Wensleydale in it and, oh, dear, did I try to do that? You know, I've got to stir this pot while I'm doing something else with this pot and yeah, I think I've decided... One variety at a time is probably a much better idea. Yeah, funny you should say that. I did the same thing when I first started off. Probably the first year, um, I tried to make a Stilton and a, or well, could have been a Pyrenees, I think, at the same time. And uh, I didn't make any mistakes, but I tell you what, I came close a few times, um, especially with the cross contamination part, especially with the add the moulds at the start of the process with the um, the blue cheese. Yeah, ha- I had to be so careful that um, yeah. the Pyrenees didn't get infected. And it didn't, which was good. But you're totally right. Very confusing. All I do now is just do a double batch of the same cheese. So still get two cheeses, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, double batch is, is a better because you, you only have to figure out one thing at a time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, blo- blokes are a bit like that. you get a one thing at a time thing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've nearly ran out of questions, Sue. Um let me think. So, you be, like you said, you've been making cheese for quite a while now. So what words of encouragement would you have for um, people who haven't yet started but they're thinking about it, they've read a cheese book but they still haven't bought the milk, haven't bought the ingredients? What would you say to them? Um, it's really not that difficult. It's just it can be a bit intimidating because there are sometimes lots of steps but it uh, – uh, as long, actually, one thing I would say, as long as you are vigilant about hygiene, because I think that was that was the mistake that I made back in 1982 or three or whenever it was, and so like that ruined the cheese for me and ruined my experience at the time, which put me off cheese making for such a long time. I think if you can be really vigilant about hygiene and just follow step by step, it's really not that difficult. Yeah, good, good, good words and good advice. Um, you really do have to pay, take particular care for sanitation at the start of the process. After that, it just flows, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. So you said you got your own herd of cows, or you live on a dairy farm, um, so you have no problems with um, with getting milk. Do you make any um, cream cheeses or anything with the cream? Any other dairy products that? Uh, that, that other people would uh, like to hear about? Um, I used to make butter many years ago, but then we changed to a rotary dairy and we had a different design of vat. So I can't actually make cream anymore. It's because you need a lot of milk to make cream. You have to run it through a separator to get the cream to then um, turn into butter. Yep. I can't actually get great huge quantities of milk anymore so um yeah butters if you can get lots of milk that you can then separate into cream it's not difficult to make at all but i just it's just too physically difficult to get it these days it would yeah. take me too long to get the milk oh. um, and so no i haven't made any cream cheeses uh, i do make yogurt yeah um on a regular basis um yeah, there's just too much else to do here. There, I bet there you should, is. You should see my veggie garden. <laughs> I have. I've looked on the blog. It's massive. Oh. <laughs> Always oh, that's work to be done. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, thanks very much for your time, Sue. I really appreciate you coming on as a guest on the Little Green Cheese podcast. Uh, any other final words, mate? Uh, no, just get out there and do it. It's um, great fun and extremely satisfying making your own stuff. I would encourage anybody to just get going. Fantastic. Thank you very much once again. That's okay. Well, we 
haven't had news on the podcast for a while, so I thought it was about time. I had some news around here the other day. On Sunday, I taught five wonderful people how to make a ricotta and mozzarella uh, down at the uh, Melton South Community House. Uh, Kim and I went along and uh, taught these people um, over the course, I think it was about three and a half hours, maybe three, and we really did enjoy ourselves. We had such a great time. Now, there are some courses coming up in November in uh, Melton, and there are some also in Park Orchards uh, over in the east side, east, northeast side of Melbourne. So have a look on the Little Green Cheese blog, and you will see all of the workshop dates. And now it's time for some listener questions. And we've got our old favourite on, uh, Jean-Michel from Nice in France. Um, He has some information about cheese suppliers over in Europe for us. So take it away, Jean-Michel. Hello, Gavin. (coughs) Jean-Michel from Nice. Um, I was uh, listening uh, to one of your podcasts speaking about uh, uh, suppliers. Uh, I w- just wanted to let you know that I found and tested a supplier in Europe, uh, uh, exactly in the UK, which is called Goat Nutrition, and uh, their internet address is gnltd.co.uk. Uh, they have everything from rennets uh, to uh, uh, malt. Uh, cultures and everything <coughs> and uh, they ship uh, in France at least and everywhere in the world but uh, I think that in Europe it's easier for them and uh, it's easy to uh, order uh, you don't even have to uh, make an account uh, it takes you five minutes and uh, I was delivered last time in five days so it was uh, it's it's nice internet shop so uh, here is what I found. Uh, thank you for everything. Bye bye. See you. Well, thank you very much, Jean Michel, for that handy information. So, anybody in uh, Europe or uh, the UK, uh, you can pop along to that uh, online store and have a look. I don't think uh, Jean Michel nor, nor myself are affiliated with that store. Uh, I think he uh, just I wanted to pass on that information. We have a uh, another listener question, and this one is from Sharon Bailey. Hi, Gavin. It's Sharon Bailey here. I just had a question, and I don't know if you can help me with it. Um, I've just managed to get some raw milk from a friend of mine, and I've made um, Trafilli cheese about a week ago, and it's brilliant yellow. I can't believe the colour of it. But it's um, a bit dry in the fridge, and I'm wondering, do you think I should wax it or leave it or maybe wax half? Just wanted your advice. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks very much, Sharon. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would wax it, or um, better still, if you can, um, then uh, and if you've got the equipment, then vacuum pack it, um, because Kefili only takes, uh, you know, three weeks. As uh, lots of listeners know, um, it's probably best if you vac pack it. Uh, that'll retain the moisture. Um, at a pinch, yeah, no problems. Wax it. Uh, just make sure you give it a wipe with. Uh, a strong brine solution before you wax it to make sure that there are no moulds present underneath the wax. And we have a comment from one of of my cheese fanciers. And this admirer had this to say about a recent Cotswold cheese that I made for her. What was the cheese like? It was incredible. It's the best ever. And I know my pickled onion cheese, and that is even better than the shop one. So what was it? The Cotswold. Cotswold. Just creamy, and the smell and the little crunch of onions as you ate it, it was just divine. Thank you, dear. You're welcome. Well, that was wonderful. That was my wife, Kim, uh, who uh, there was savouring the taste of the Cotswold cheese which is basically a double Gloucester with dried onions and dried chives added to it. Um, I'm going to be posting the YouTube video tutorial on how to make that cheese over the next week. Um, It's been in my inbox for a while, but I'll have that up on YouTube by the weekend. So watch out for that one. And one final 
voicemail from Jean-Michel again. Can't stay away, can he? Hello, Gavin. Uh, Jean-Michel from Nice again. I had a second thing to say to you uh, about uh, um, the test I've done of making cheese with uh, micro-filtered uh, milk. So, uh, compared to uh, <coughs> the normal pasteurized milk I was using before, it's much better. Of course, uh, uh, we still need a starter, as you uh, had uh, mentioned before, uh, that I didn't know. But, <coughs> on the other hand, the curd are very hard, very firm, uh, very good. Uh, it's easy to, to, to react with the rennet. So again, you were right, even if you had not uh, l uh, tested uh, this milk yourself. Second thing, the, the cheese was uh, much creamier uh, than, uh, than, bef than, than before with the pasteurized milk. And I remind you that in both cases, I had not uh, uh, used any starter because I didn't have <laughs> starter, uh, so um, so it's uh, this kind of milk is very good uh, when we count fine raw milk, and uh, next time I will use starters for the first time and let you know. So there is what I had to tell you and every everyone if you <laughs> if you again <laughs> make me speak on your your podcast now uh, I feel like a rock star like the other listener you were speaking about so bye bye uh, uh, Gavin and thanks again for everything you are doing for us bye no problem Jean-Michel no mate you are a rock star I think you've appeared on the show four times already uh, but don't stop sending in those listener questions um, and comments um, because they are valuable for the beginner cheesemaker and Gee, I tell you what, even I learnt something about the micro-filtered milk. So that's fantastic. So if anybody else has got any listener questions, um, drop on by the littlegreencheese.com and on the right-hand sidebar, there's a little voicemail tab. So you can leave a voicemail there um, for everybody to listen to. Uh, and it can be a question, it can be a comment, it can be anything. Um, and uh, I'll pop those up on the next show. So that's all we've got time for this week. You can pop over to littlegreencheese.com and find my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. It's available in all ebook formats and you can even buy it as a PDF uh, where you can print it. You can find my cheese making video tutorials within the ebook or on my YouTube channel. So thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, News Theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows.